Praise the Lord. This is a wonderful day. Today is Easter Sunday, and this is a day that we celebrate when Jesus rose from the dead. It's nice for each and every one of you that are here and that are listening, and I pray that God really speaks to your heart. Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer first before we start? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity of sharing your word, Lord, of just letting people know that Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is all-powerful. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Father, whoever is listening, wherever they are, may you speak to their hearts, meet the need, meet the cry of their heart, I pray, and reveal yourself to them in a special way today. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, this is Easter Sunday, and every year we celebrate as Christians three special days, all right? The first is, of course, Christmas, where we celebrate his birth, and the second is Good Friday. Then we celebrate the death of Jesus, and the third, which is today, Easter, we celebrate his resurrection. Now, many people celebrate his death more than his resurrection. I should even say at the expense of his resurrection. They, they think of him as dead all the time. I, I'm going to tell you a story. This happened many, many years ago when we were on our way back to America from our first, um, I think it was our first time out in Singapore. So in those days, we would take cargo ship. And uh, there were only 12 passengers on the ship. And uh, the, the main thing of the ship was to carry cargo here or there. So one of our first stops was the Philippines. Then we were going to stop two or three times in the Philippines. Anyways, my, my children were all, uh, like three of them, very young. And then I had a baby. So it was very difficult to, you know, go off the ship and take all these little children. So my husband and I had this agreement that at one stop he would go, I would stay on board and look after the family. And the next stop I would get off and uh, go sightseeing, so to speak. And then he would stay on board. Well, this was my turn. And um, I had uh, rented, if you want to say, uh, I don't know a better word for it, a, a, a tour guide. But I'm the only one. I, it's not a whole tour. But this lady, uh, I paid her to be my guide. And so I, we got off the ship and she took me. Now, she was a Catholic. And so what she did was she brought me to a big Catholic cathedral that was very, very famous to them. And uh, we had to climb a lot of steps going up the hill. And then we got to the top of this hill. Here was this huge cathedral. And they had a like a porch or a veranda with big pillars in it, uh, very large. And then you walked across that and entered into the cathedral itself. But as I was following behind her, she was ahead of me, I, I noticed that there was like a, ca a coffin, a casket of some sort there on that veranda. She just walked right by it, uh, didn't pay any attention. I thought, oh my goodness, this is a funeral. I need to go and check it out because I'm a very curious person. So i following her, but I'm sidling over where I can look over the edge of the big coffin. And it, to my horror and dismay, there was a statue of Jesus lying dead in the coffin. And I just thought to myself, what a terrible thing. To, every time you come to church, you walk by a coffin with Jesus dead in it. Yes, you're commemorating his death, but what can a dead Savior do for you? A dead person cannot help you at all. And so, you know, without his resurrection, I want to tell you his birth and his death are absolutely in vain. I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 says, If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. That means empty, worthless, useless. All right. Verse 17 and 18. 
if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, empty. You are yet in your sins. Even though he died and paid the price of your sin, had he not raised from the dead, it wouldn't have counted at all. All right? Because the very fact that he raised from the dead meant that God said he himself had no sin. If he didn't raise from the dead, though he took your place, substituted for you, had he not raised from the dead, it would be God saying, hey, you got your own sin to pay for. I'm not letting you rise from the dead. But the fact that he arose from the dead showed he was a, a lamb without blemish that could offer himself on your behalf and on my behalf. So it says, they also which are fallen asleep in Christ or perish. That means our hope of resurrection. We don't have it if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, but he did raise. That's what verse 20 says. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become what? The first fruits of them that slept. Oh, praise God. The first fruits means he ripened first. He was the first group to resurrect. And because he did, it means there will be a harvest and our turn will come. And we also have that great hope of resurrection. Uh, th there's a song that we sing and I want to say it here. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know he holds the future. And I know he holds my hand. There's another way, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Now, I want us to go to um, Romans chapter 1, verse 4. It says, and he, he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I don't, I don't know if uh, what that says to you. But, you know, you, first I want us to notice about according to the spirit of holiness. Now, the Holy Spirit has many names. He's the spirit of grace, spirit of mercy, uh, many other names. But here, he, specifically, he's called the spirit of holiness. If it would have said, according to the spirit of grace, we will know Christ didn't really deserve it. If it would be the spirit of mercy, it meant he deserved to die and deserved the punishment. No, it says the spirit of holiness. God's Holy Spirit came upon him and resurrected him from the dead. And it was God's declaration to the world. He is my son and he is my son with power, miracle working power and authority. He's not just a name. He's not just a person. He is the son of God with power. And it's the resurrection that proves this. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. You and I serve a risen savior. We don't serve a dead savior. He's alive with all power and he can hear and he can answer prayer. Uh, I'm wanting to tell you a story right now uh, to il illustrate how great the power of God is. You know, during World War II, I was only 10 years old at that time. And uh, we were in Peking, China, when the Japanese and uh, began to fight again, went to war with America, in other words. So immediately we became prisoners of war because they had already taken over Peking. And um, they, they came into our home for about eight days uh, of house arrest. And we used to have to have, you know, um, roll calls. Whenever these soldiers would come, there'd be one officer and about four or five men under him, each one holding a gun and a bayonet. Uh, and the, the minute they came, they called for roll call. And you had to line up according. My father was the first. He was like... Six, um, he was six foot two inches, gray hair. I only knew him with white hair. Then my mother was next. She's only five foot half inch. Then my sister, 16, 
would be in the third place, my brother 13 in the next place, and I was 10 and a half, I was the last there. And you had to stand at attention and keep your face straight like that. But this day that they arrived, my sister didn't realize it, so her spot was empty. And my mother realizing it, called, Gwen, Gwen, hurry up and come. Now she was washing clothes in the bathroom, which was down at the end of the hall uh, by hand. And when she heard it was roll call, she came running. She didn't even take time to dry her fingers. They were still dripping with soapy water. And, and she came in over there, the door, uh, the entrance into our living room was there. Straight across were these soldiers lined up. And then here, we were standing in our roll call position. So she starts cutting across diagonally across the rug to get into her place. And as she's coming across the uh, the parlor rug, this officer in charge folds his arms like this and begins to eye her up and down. Mm-hmm, just what one would want, yes. He said this all in broken English so that we could understand and when the truth hit her. Uh, she just looked over at my mother and father and her mouth opened wide. I'll never forget the scream that came out of her lungs. Mama, mama, save me, save me. And, and I heard my mother, a very still, small voice, but no fear in it at all, very steady voice. She just said, Gwen, mom and daddy cannot save you now. Now has come the time you have to put your hope and trust in this Jesus that I have been teaching you about. Everything went dead silent. Of course, we were praying in our hearts. My mother said later she was praying, God, just put a wall of fire. It means a wall of protection round about my daughter. Everything just got still. Actually, we should have been the nervous ones, but that officer in charge started to fidget and go from foot to foot. And then he looked over at my mother and father, tossed his head. He said, we go, come back a few minutes. And he went out and the, the rest of them had to follow him. That group never came back in our house again. But we found out after we were free from house arrest that many atrocities had taken place in some of the other homes. I'm here to tell you we have a God who is a living God. Jesus is alive and he can hear us. Hallelujah. Now, I want to go on about Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 to 11, it tells us in that portion that G, uh, tells us that because Jesus lived a life of obedience, even being willing to die on the cross. Let me read that. He made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, verse 9, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So today, my message, I've titled it, The Name Above All Names, all right? The Name Above All Names. Jesus, God gave Jesus a name. He highly exalted him, gave him a name above every name that's ever been named, whether in heaven, on earth, under the earth, all right? Now, what does um, a name depict? It depicts a, the person the character, the position, and the power or authority. A name depicts that. You know, you could say my name out in the world. Nobody knows who Margaret Seward is. But here in Singapore, if you say Lee Kuan Yew, that was our former prime minister, everybody knows that name. Everybody knew the power he had, the authority he had, and so forth. When, when he was alive, uh, people trembled at that name. So Jesus has a name, though, above every name. There is no entity that has the person, the position, and the power that Jesus has. Let, let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. 
neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name of Jesus, all right? It, it, only Jesus. God has given that name Jesus. It, it means salvation. It means Savior. It, it means Jehovah saves. Jehovah delivers. Jehovah gives victory. That's what that name means. And every time we call on that name, we're asking for his salvation, his help, his deliverance, his victory. Amen. In Matthew 121, it's, uh, it's a prophecy telling about Mary. Uh, it says that she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's the name that we're talking about today. The name above all names, Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. All right. So now let's go to the next thing. We're going to talk about his position and his power. For this, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. All right. It says earlier in one of the earlier verses says that we might know. And there were three things to know. I'm not going to deal with those other two, only about his name. All right. That we might know. But I, what I want you to realize is the Holy Spirit wants us to know. He doesn't want us to be blind. He doesn't want us to be in um, you know, ignorance. The devil likes to blind our eyes to the truth, but God wants us to know the truth. Whether the truth seems good or whether it seems bad, he wants us to see things clearly. And he says that you might know, verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power? That's dunamis power, miracle working power to us word, who believe, all right? Not those who claim they believe, but they really believe because God has put that faith in them, all right? According to the working of his mighty power, he didn't leave us to imagine what kind of power this was. He gave us a rule of measurement. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, all right, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Now, let, let's go back and do that, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You know, in the natural, when something dies, it, it's hopeless. It's the end. It's finished. Uh, you don't expect to go on pinning your hopes on it. When they say it's dead, it's dead. If a person dies, they're dead. If a dream is dead, you don't dig it up again. No, it's just dead. But it says here, when he raised him from the dead, that means he has power, all right? That no matter what your situation is, no matter how hopeless it is, no matter how seemingly impossible it is, since Christ could be raised from the dead, he has the power to raise you out of whatever that situation is. He has the power to deliver you, to set you free, and to give you hope again. It says not only did he raise him from the dead, but he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's his position. He's on the right hand of the Father. He's right next to the Father. He was exalted there, high above everything else. All right. And he's seated there with all power and authority given into his hand. Uh, and from that vantage point, all right, and it tells us in that next verse that that position is far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. You know, a lot of times people try to say that Jesus and the devil are equal. One is the height for the good things, and the devil is has the height for the bad things. No, 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 no. They're not equal at all. There's no comparison. It says they're, they're not on an equal par. It says he's far. He's not just barely above. He's far above all principality power. These are bad things. It doesn't matter, good or bad. 
all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world that is to come. You know, in this journey of faith that you and I are taking, there will be times of trouble. And I have four points, and that is in this journey, let's take his name, let's share his name, and let's believe in his name, and let's trust his name. And, and let's just look at these four points that we have here, all right? Take his name. There's power in the name of Jesus. So take that name wherever you go. In fact, I woke up uh, when this sermon was first born in my heart. I woke up with that song. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it, then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. There's power in that name to save, all right, to save. We, we already talked a bit about that. His name was to save us from all of our sin. But I'll always remember the story my mother told about this uh, lady in China. Uh, there, there was this group that came into the church. They had followed, uh, because uh, the band, we had a band, they had drums and, uh, you know, trumpets and tambourines, and they would go out on the street, uh, street side and, and play until they gathered a big crowd and then like the Pied Piper they would slowly uh, go toward the church and this whole group would follow them. They would go in the door and once they got in then they would lock the door and they had a captive audience. The men were put on one side, the women on the other side. At the end of the sermon that day uh, they were invited to come up and you know accept the Lord cry out to God. There was an altar up there in the front. And this elderly woman came up. She had tiny little bound feet. And she went up there and knelt down. And suddenly from the altar, she cried out, it's gone, it's gone. My mother ran over there to see what was gone, you know, thought maybe it was her, or they, they would keep their money in their handkerchief and put it down inside of their clothes. Thought maybe it had dropped out. Maybe somebody had stolen it from her. And, and my mother said, what's gone? What's gone? She says, oh, that burden. I've been carrying that burden for so long, so many years. She said, I've gone from one temple to another temple. Uh, in, in Chinese, they call it miao, miao tang. You know, and she said she's gone from one to another. And she's, you know, ke tou, that means to take your head and knock it on the ground. And, but she said, I would always leave with the burden still there, still there. But I came up here and cried out to Jesus, and that burden is gone. I'm here to tell you that that name is powerful. When we call upon it, it's power to save us, all right? Not only to save us from our sin, but it's, there's power in that name to deliver us from habits, to deliver us from terrible situations, there's power in that name when we cry out. There's power in that name to heal, all right? I, I remember this one time. Uh, this is quite within the last year, you know, and I attend a church called Victory International Church, and um, a, a lady had invited us, my husband and I, to go to eat that day. She wanted to celebrate not Mother's Day or Father's Day, but t two together at one time. And she was going to take us to a very nice um, restaurant to eat. But she told me the time, and it was before the church let out. And I said, no, 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 no. I won't leave church early just to go to eat. So I said, you, you change the time of that. But I said, what we will do, we'll sit in the back row, and then when they say amen, we'll get out before people start talking and getting you and, and so forth like that. So we were on the back row and they were ha having a closing prayer and the pastor's wife came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you be able to uh, talk with this girl? I said, no, I don't have time. I have to leave the, as soon as the meeting is over. She said, no, she says, it, it isn't counseling. She said, just pray for her. Uh, she has a four and a half inch cyst 
inside of her. And, and tomorrow morning she has to go for an operation. She was a teenager. Uh, her parents attended that church. So I said, yes, if it's to pray, I'll pray for her. So uh, the minute the amen was said, I went over there and, you know, I laid hands on her. But I, I remember I just read the day before about visualizing God, visualizing his his throne and, you know, seeing the light of his glory and bringing it down instead of just, you know, seeing nothing. So I thought this is a good time to try that out on this girl. So I laid my hands on her and raised my, closed my eyes, but raised my face toward heaven. And I just visualized the throne of God, the light coming out of it was just beautiful and a flashing light. And I just said, Lord, just send the light of your healing power right down into her body right now and uh, heal this girl in the name of Jesus. It was a very short prayer. And, and then I, I hugged her and then we turned and left. Well, you know, the next day, the pastor's wife called me in the afternoon. She had gone in for her appointment and they could find no trace of that four and a half inch cyst in her body. It was gone totally. I'm here to tell you the name of Jesus is powerful to save, all right? Not only that, but there's supernatural signs and wonders. Let's turn to um, Mark 16, 17 and 18. It says, these signs shall follow them that believe. Not just Jesus, but you and I who believe. In my name, here it is. We take the name of Jesus with us. In his name, we, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, verse 18. They shall take up serpents. They shall drink any deadly thing. If they drink it, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So notice here, my friend, it says that you and I who have the name of Jesus, if we will believe, all right, that's have the faith of Jesus Christ in our hearts, then we can use that name and we can cast out devils. I know this to be real and true. I've seen it happen many times, all right? To speak with new tongues, to take dominion over the power of the devil, to tread him down, amen. And no matter what, I, this thing about drinking any deadly thing, I, I can remember a friend of mine, she married a missionary to... Um, Africa and they went into a different area of Africa and the people were out to kill them but they were doing it in a in a very like deceitful deceptive way so they welcomed them and then brought them meat which they had dipped in poison and it had poison in it and, and they gave it to them but of course not telling them what they had done and their idea was that they were going to kill them and destroy them but they cooked it prayed over it they didn't know the difference and they just thanked God for provision and thanked the Lord for it and ate the food nothing happened at all those natives came to them and said you should be dead that's when the whole story came out and they found out that they had eaten this poisonous meat but God had protected them because of the name of Jesus amen so, um, you know, let, let's go to Acts chapter 3, verse 6. There are some things money cannot buy. It says, then Peter said, this is the story of Peter at the gate, beautiful, when that lame man, he was lame from his mother's womb, never walked in his life. He was over 40 years old, laying there asking for alms. He was begging, that he was a beggar. That was the only way he could make money or get money to eat and Peter looks at him and says silver and gold have I none no money don't don't think because we have no money that it's it's a hopeless situation no I tell you there are things that are worth more than just money and there are some things that money cannot buy he says but such as I have he knew what he had in the name of Jesus he had the name of Jesus, and he knew it. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he reached out, took him by the hand, and this man that had never walked before, all right, in 40 years, 
leaped up and strength came into him. He didn't even have to learn to walk. He began to jump and dance and shout and give God the glory. Let's jump down to verse 16. It says, his name, through faith in his name. It's not just saying the name of Jesus. It's having faith in that name hath made this man strong, which you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him. That means it's not just you're trying to believe. Oh, I've I've heard it ever since I was a little child. I was taught this. Of course, I believe it. No, 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 no. This is faith that is a spiritual fruit of the Spirit. This is a gift of the Spirit that God himself puts into our heart when we want to know, when we desire to believe, really want to believe that he just puts his faith there. It says, the faith that is by him hath given him this perfect soundness. So it's not only faith in the name, that faith itself is a gift of God. It's nothing that you work up. I remember going to somebody once and saying, won't you believe? They said, I'm trying. No, 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 no. There is no such a thing. You don't try to believe. You either have it or you don't have it. God has either dropped it there and Oh, you know, you know that you know, and you believe. Amen. All right, I'm going to take you to another verse, which is um, Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That's the faith. It is a gift of God, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. So friends, uh, let me tell you, take that name wherever you go and cry out to God. If you don't have the faith, say, God, I need your faith. Put that faith within me. Help me cast down the doubt and the unbelief and let faith arise because there's nothing impossible with him. Now, my next point is to share his name. All right. Romans 10, 13 and 14. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher. Let me go over that again. How shall they call if they haven't believed in the name of Jesus? How are they going to believe if they've never heard? How are they going to hear if nobody has told them? I, I remember this dear brother, his name, Brother Cho from Elam Church. He was a very elderly man. He was already retired, a, a businessman. And, and he, one day he was had gone out for his early morning walk and he'd come back to his yard. And then this uh, Hindu doctor who was about 90 years old was also taking a daily walk and walked by and stopped and, and they conversed, they talked with each other. And uh, Brother Cho shared with uh, this Hindu doctor about Jesus and said, wouldn't you like to come to church with me? And he said, okay, I will. So he accepted. He came to church and he heard the message there at Elam and he accepted the Lord that day. Uh, it, uh, it was miraculous. And um, not only did he accept the Lord, within a week or so, he was baptized in water. He stood up, he testified to the realization that he now knew that he was born again. You know, Hindus have about 150,000 gods. He had to turn his back on all of those gods that he personally worshipped because you can't have more than one god. You, you have to just accept Jesus and Jesus alone. There is no other name given by God under heaven whereby we must be saved. No other name. You're not going to share it with anybody else. It's only the name of Jesus. Only God can save. And, and Jesus means Jehovah saves. Amen. So how shall they hear without a preacher? All right. I remember uh, when I was traveling around quite a bit. And this one trip that I went on, I was alone. 
and I had to change planes. So I got off the one plane, and as soon as I got off, I looked up to see where my next gate was to be, and I said, I'll go up there, and I'll just sit there to make sure that, you know, I'm in the right place and everything. So I sat down to wait for the uh, gate to open, and um, there was a Japanese lady next to me. She was younger than I was, uh, well-dressed, and I said, do you speak English? She said, oh, little, but actually, she was very well-versed in English, and I found out that she was a Japanese sports lady. She was traveling around playing sports here and there. So I began to share with her not only about Jesus, but true stories in my life, experiences of how he is alive and real and how he can save and so forth. Uh, anyways, finally, I just felt led to ask, what, you know, she had never heard about Jesus, ever. She didn't know who Jesus was. And as I shared it, she, be, I said, would you like to in invite him into your heart? She said, yes. So I led her in a prayer, and she accepted the Lord in her heart. And, you know, suddenly the loudspeaker came, and she looked at, oh, she said, I've got to get, get to the gate. Well, if she has to get to the gate, I, I need to get to the gate. But you know what? She turned around and thanked me and thanked me over and over again. Thank you. Thank you for helping me to come to Jesus Christ and to know about him. Then when I looked up there, I was in the wrong place. How I got in the wrong place, I will never know. But somehow God used it and praise God. I quickly ran as fast as I could to get to my own place. But we need to share his name because it might be somebody who has never known. We need to share him. I I'm going to share one more story on that. Usually uh, I don't have it written down, but it comes to me. And that was another time. This time my husband and I were traveling and my youngest daughter, Connie, was going with us. We were going from uh, Tacoma down to California and while we were waiting for the plane, the, the waiting room was packed, packed with people. And there was this Filipina uh, lady that worked for the airlines. And she came over and started talking and making small talk. How are you? And uh, Where are you from? And it's different things. Is everything all right? And that, that was her job to do that. And then the Lord said to me in my heart, well, why are you making small talk? Why don't you tell her about me? So I said to her, um, do you know Jesus? And she said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, I never ask you if you're a Roman Catholic. I ask you, do you know Jesus? So I turned it around and I said, have you ever been born again? And she said, oh, you know, a, a year or so ago, I was posted to Korea and I attended a church for almost a year. And every Sunday they talked about this being born again, being born again. And I said, yes, but I'm asking you, have you been born again? And she said, no. She dropped her head. I said, would you like to be born again? I can lead you right now. I can, you can open your heart to it. Religion isn't going to do it. It isn't religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. She said, yes. I led her in a prayer. She accepted the Lord into her heart. And you know what she did when she said amen and after inviting him into her heart? she In front of everybody, she threw her arms around me and hugged me. And, and her, she didn't just say it soft, you know, quietly. She really, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because all this time, a whole year in a church, she had heard about being born again, but nobody ever led her or showed her how to be born again. Friends, you and I have his name. Let's not only take it with us, let's share it wherever we go. Now, my third point is to believe his name. All right. Believing is more than mental or verbal assent. I believe it's acting upon it. All right. If you really believe it, you will act upon it. Jesus says the devils also believe and tremble, but they're not going to heaven. Right. They claim to believe, but there's no change in their life. No. All right. So to really believe means a change of lifestyle or behavior. Let's look at first Peter 1, 14 and 15. 
as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. You see, our behavior, the way we act, the way we talk, our attitudes, our, um, our thinking, all of that fashions us. It changes us to be like whatever we are doing or behaving. And it says, before we knew Christ, we were ignorant that God is a holy God. But now that we've accepted him, verse 15, it says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Don't act holy. Be. Being is internal change, all right? Be ye holy in all manner of conversation or all manner of lifestyle or behavior. And so you see, friends, I'm here to tell you, if we really believe, we will start obeying, not just certain things, not just the things we want to obey. It is more than just being able to quote scripture. It's more than being able, like me, to preach about it. You can preach about it and yet not have it in your own life. You can tell others what they need to do and yet not have it in your own life. No, it says we need to realize whatever is in there, it's for us, whether it's small things, big things, whatever. And don't say, but I can't. I, that's not me. I still remember when I was a teenager and, and I had a violent temper and, and I was lost my temper one day in the car. Dad, My dad was driving. I don't remember why I was having a temper tantrum and He's driving, and he turned to me, and he said, Margaret, don't behave like that. That isn't Christ-like. That isn't the way a Christian should behave. And, and, you know, I remember after being angry like that, I turned around and started to laugh. And I said, Daddy, you don't seem to understand. I was born like this. See, I believed in Jesus, but I had no idea or did I have any thought that it was going to mean change? That I could change? Yeah, we're all born in sin. We're all born with terrible ways and so forth. Uh, we have an aptitude to sin. But when we are born again, Jesus comes into our life. He gives us power to overcome. Power to live this new life that is put into our spirit. The Christ life. To allow that life to begin to function instead of that old nature, that old man. I had no intention of changing. I didn't realize I could change. I just thought you believe in Jesus. When you die, you go to heaven. When I get to heaven, I'll be changed. No, you change down here. You change down here. Let me read it again. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or lifestyle or behavior. I'm going to tell you this story about a lady. All right. She was a Hindu lady in Nepal. She had been a Hindu all of her life. And then she turned to the Lord and accepted him and really, really became a believer in the Lord Jesus. And, um, she had a cell group. She allowed her home to be opened up and used as uh, to meet for the cell group to meet there. So this one day, they were meeting there in the evening to have their service, and the cell leader was there, uh, uh, one of the men, one of the pastors from the church, and um, she had a son. She had a grown son who was a Maoist leader in the. Um, Nepal Maoist army. He, he was an officer and he had come home that day. And so he was there that evening. And she said to him before the meeting started, she said, you know, uh, I, I am now a child of God. I'm a Christian. And I just want you to know that should anything ever happen to me and, and my time comes that I die, I don't want to be buried as a Hindu, which would be to, you know, to be burnt, uh, cremated. She said, I, I want to be buried with a Christian burial. So she introduced him 
to this cell leader of hers, said, should anything ever happen to me, you, you get a hold of him and uh, let, let them do my burial for me. Well, you know, in less than two weeks, I believe, she, she died. Peace, peacefully, she died. She didn't know she was going to die, but that had to be God that she had done this. So this Maoist leader comes to the, uh, looks up, whether he, he phoned him, whatever. I don't know how they got in touch, but he got in touch with him. And he said, I, I want to bring some of my men with me to the funeral. And they came, I, uh, over 20, uh, they came all dressed in their uniforms and standing at attention with their guns and so forth as the coffin went by. But suddenly during the funeral um, meeting, the meeting that they had for the funeral, he stood up and he said, I want to say something. I have a few words to say. Uh, the, the leaders were kind of worried. What, what is he going to say? You know, he's not a Christian. What is he going to say? He got up and he said, I, I want you all to know five years ago, my mother went from being a Hindu to accepting this Jesus. She started worshiping this God called Jesus. And he said, before that, I never knew a mother's love. She used to beat us when I was young, scolded us, was mean to us. I hated her in my heart, he said. In fact, he said, I joined the army because I thought one day I'll kill you. But five years ago, when she started to worship this Jesus, I started knowing what a mother's love was. And for five years, I've experienced a mother's love. And he sat down. Wow, talk about believing on the name of Jesus. You see, friends, people only can know what they see in our lives. You can tell them, I'm a Christian. But if they don't see your behavior, your attitude, your ways, your words, any different than anybody else, it's not going to impact them. It's not going to impression them at all. But when they see change take place, in fact, change that is like impossible, a total character change, it speaks to their heart, it speaks to their heart. Let's go to the last one now, last point. Trust his name. Psalms 20 verse 7 and 8 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. That means they trust in natural reinforcements. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. All right. We're going to trust in the Spirit. We're going to put our trust in the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Then verse 8 says, they, who's they? Those that trust in the natural. They are brought down and fallen, but we who trust in the name of our God, we are risen and stand upright. Hallelujah. So I tell you, it pays to trust in the name of the Lord. I'm not going to tell it here, but I'm going to just refer to it. If you remember the story of David and Goliath, and, you know, um, he had that Goliath was well armed armor all over the place and, you know, spear and shield and armor bearer and all the rest of it. And he came out and he said, come out, come out, you know, and here comes this little lad, so to speak, a teenager with nothing but maybe a loincloth and, and a, a sling, no, no protection, nothing at all. And, and David said, you come to me with sword and shield, but I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. He's a living God. Oh, and today you all are going to know that he is alive and real. And he took one stone and he attacked, you know, through that stone. And I like to say that that was the first guided missile. Yeah. I really believe had... That giant moved here or there. The stone would have swung around and followed him because it got the one only place that was not protected and sunk deep into his forehead and he crashed down. 
Yeah, the name of the Lord our God. Let's trust in the name. Uh, th there's a difference between faith and trust. The word faith, all right, is in the ability of God. When you talk about faith and what God can do. But when we talk about trust, we're believing in the character of God, all right? Trust speaks of dark times, hard times, trying times. Uh, trust is believing that God is good no matter what the circumstances look like. No matter how bleak the, the picture is, we know God is a good God. We never allow that thought that, oh God, what kind of a God are you? No, 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 no. If we really trust him through thick or through thin, we know he is a good God. All right. Job is a good example of this, all right? He, he went through months of suffering, physical suffering, where worms literally crawled out, in and out of the wounds on his flesh. He, he, his body was down to skin and bones. There was a stench about him. He had lost everything, you know, all his wealth. He, had, he was the richest man of the East of those days. He lost all his wealth. He had 10 children. He lost all his children. I, I mean, you talk about a dark picture. And this is what he says in Job 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. It doesn't matter what, even if he wants to kill me, I know that he is a good God, a great God. And do you know... Job didn't die then at all, but rather Job lived for 140 years after that. Looked like he was going to die. Everybody thought he was going to die. His own wife said, why don't you curse God and die? You know, she had given up on him. But God is a good God. You know, he, he, he allowed Job to go through some terrible things, but through his life, you and I learn so much. Amen. And God not only restored everything double, he gave him 10 more children. And you might say, yeah, but he lost the first 10. He only ended up with 10, even though all, the, all his livestock, he had twice as much. His gold and silver, he had twice as much at the end. But you know what? because he prayed for them daily, all 10 are in heaven. Then God gave him 10 more, so he, he had double the amount. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. You see, we look at outward circumstances, and we make judgments according to what it looks like, what it seems like, what it feels like, what it tastes like. No, no, no. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Recognize he's there. Don't, don't trust your own understanding, but learn to hear from him. Let him direct your path. Let him tell you when to go, when not to go, when to move, when not to move, when to be still, when to go to bed. Yeah, let him tell you. And, and as you learn to let him direct you, things will work. I, I'm reminded of this true story. Uh, I don't remember the year, but it was the year when there was that terrible uh, big tsunami. And um, there, this family used to attend our church in Elam. The wife was very committed to the Lord. The husband, though he claimed to be a child of God, he, he didn't begin to have the faith that his wife had. They had two children, and he was a businessman, so he was taking them on this vacation and they went to Sri Lanka. They had, uh, you know, put money down for this hotel by the ocean, by the sea. And, uh, they had arrived there and just as they're about ready to, you know, get book, go in and get booked in, the, the wife said, to the husband, God is telling me we cannot stay here tonight. We must not stay here. They were planning to go up into the mountains uh, two or three days later. God is saying, go tonight, go tonight, go tonight. Oh, the husband was not happy. He'd already paid money down. Uh, and, you know, he just wasn't happy at all. But she just was firm. And she says, I know God is showing me this. And so, and from her past life, uh, things that had happened, he, he trusted her evidently because 
he said, all right. So they got away and they, they went up into the mountains. That night, the tsunami came. That hotel was washed away. Everybody died. Nobody was left alive. It, it was a terrible thing. And you know, had she not obeyed, had the husband not been willing to trust that the wife did hear from God, I'm here to say trust in him with all of your heart. It, it, it looked beautiful. It looked lovely. It looked like everything was all right. But, you know, and you, you might even say, well, why didn't God warn her head? You go ask God. Don't ask me. He was testing their faith. I just know that it pays to trust the Lord and not lean to our own understanding. Uh, another true story that I'm going to tell you, it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Bring him into the picture. This was a, a lady that I knew and had been very close to, all right, and she was a nurse, and now she was studying in the university, taking a course, because she wanted to, you know, go up and become a, like an administrative nurse. So in one of her classes, the lecturer gave them pages and pages of true, false, true, false, true, false. And he said, take it back and, you know, study these questions because your, your exam is going to come out of these questions. Oh my, how in the world to learn all those questions? True, false, true, false, so many of them. How to remember and not get them mixed up? Well, she went to the Lord and she said, Lord, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and went and said, God, please show me. How do I study for this? I, I can't memorize all these. And the Lord said to her, you know, when you go through these questions, the majority are true. The lesser are false. You memorize the false ones. Memorize what is false. And then when a question comes on the paper, if it's not false, you know it's true. And you know, she came out with 100%. Everybody else, they, they just, they were amazed. How, how could you do it? How did you do it? Because, you know, she acknowledged God in her time of need and she went to him. And then she trusted what he told her. Um, Psalm 62, 8 says, trust in him at all times, you people, all right? Not just the good times, but also in the bad times. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Praise the Lord. Perhaps today there are some here who have heard and know about Jesus, but you've never really called upon his name. And today I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you. He wants to help you. He wants to forgive and cleanse you. He wants to meet your every need. It says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I see that calling is not just repeat a prayer after me. It means their heart, they're desperate. They're desperate for God and they call out to him. And when you, you are in that state of, I just need help, God. Please help me. Those kind of prayers are always answered, always answered. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. My friend, he's a living God. He's a real God. And he's able to hear your cry and answer your prayer. He will come into your heart if you cry out to him today. He will change your life. He will give you a future that you can, your hope can be fulfilled that one day you are going to see him. One day, because Jesus arose from the dead, you also are going to rise from the dead. He was our first fruits, and we will be part of that harvest that goes up. We're the, he was the first of the first fruits. You and I can be the first fruits, and then there will be the harvest. I don't want to be part of the harvest. I want to be part of the first fruits. 
He was the first of the first fruits. His resurrection gives hope into our life. I have many over there. My mother, my father, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my brother, my sister, my son, my own husband. They're all over there. But one day I'm going to see Jesus first of all face to face. And then I'll see them too. And you can have the same hope in you. Shall we bow our heads? Spirit of the living God, speak to each and every one of our hearts today, wherever we are, wherever we're watching from, Lord, speak to our hearts that you are the true and the living God, that Jesus is alive. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. And Lord, I pray that as I receive him into my heart, I am now seated with him in heavenly places. Those that today are praying to receive you for the first time, cleanse them, wash them now, remove them, plant them into your family. Let your spirit come into them. And Lord, may they be born again today in the realm of the spirit with new hope, with new faith, with new love in their heart as they begin to walk with you and talk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.